tales for dark nights. All right, Archibald. You uh, have the list. Uh, call me Archie. Uh, uh, yeah, check. Right. Uh, and Archibald, you know not to leave the castle unlocked at night, right? Uh, call me Archie. Oh yeah, I, I got it. <laughs> Excellent. Now, Archibald, all the important numbers are by the phone. Okay. Don't feed the interns after 9 p.m. And for goodness sake, no matter what the other half says, do not let him dress the zombies in my clothes anymore. Do you know how long it took me to get that smell out of my cape? Call me Archie. Oh yeah, I, I got it. Really? You're leaving the puppet in charge? Um, yes. Frankly, with the puppet in charge, I feel more secure that a crisis or perhaps possible bloody massacre can be averted. Um, um, guys? Vent figure, please. Must the struggles of us not people go unrecognized? Hmm. Okay. You gents have a wonderful time. While I'm away. Bye bye, Jim. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> Great. Now that he's gone, we can play. <laughs> oh, God. Here we go. <laughs> Hit it! Come one, come all, to our matinee of madness, and partake in this theater of the mind. Welcome to the Simply Scary Podcast, Season 1, Episode 16. I'm your temporary master of ceremonies, Archibald Carlyle. see around us, but often we take for granted the realm of logic we occupy. That is why a reality of the impossible can be so utterly disturbing to us. Whether perceived as bland or boring, we securely blanket ourselves in the safe, common knowledge that right is right, up is up, and things that are inanimate are just that. But not in my world. Join me, won't you, as we reveal the unimaginable landscape of Twisted Worlds. Hey, other half, you want to do the honest? Sure thing, Archie. Um, folks, just a word to the warning. This episode will be a bit more twisted than usual and may not be appropriate for younger listeners, so... We will give you the obligatory count of three to clear the little crumb crunchers out of the room. Ready? One, two, three. You have been warned. It's all yours, buddy. And now, let us experience our first signpost of the surreal. Never has the land of make-believe been so horrifying as in our first endeavor. We take you to somewhere between a nightmare and a bad dose of cough syrup as a young girl struggles to overcome a dark force that stalks her relentlessly through an endless sea of terrors. But what may be more frightening is what that dark force has unwittingly released. Jason Hill performs S. Boyd Taylor's Teddy Bears and Tea Parties. With her hands still shaking, 
The little girl wipes a circle of blood clean from the kitchen window. Her pinky is missing, still bleeding where it's been cut off. She knows he's out there, watching. There, the shadow between the hungry-eyed houses, short, round man on a unicycle, tall hat, flat teeth, no eyes. Just an eyeball he stole in a monocle loop that he holds to his forehead with four-fingered hands. The little girl puts the teddy bear by the sink, a ratty old bear with greasy, olive-colored fur. She hopes it's the last one alive. Dead teddy bears fill the kitchen counters beside her, each killed in different ways. One with its head severed and grape jelly blood still spurting thick and gloppy onto the floor, one dismembered, one burning on the stove giving off thick, grape-scented smoke. Careful of the claws, she checks the toaster cords that bind the last bear's wrists. She tries to remember his name so she can question him, but her sister had so many bears. Are, are you going to kill me too? He asks. Where are the others? He cringes and whimpers but does not answer. She glances at the knife lying on the stained counter. Don't kill me. You work for him. That thing outside. After all those years keeping us safe, you let him touch you, change you. The little girl picks up the knife. It's as long as her arm, blade sticky with jelly. I'll, I'll tell you anything. Just don't kill me. Where are the others hiding? In the attic. The girl pulls the knife close to the bear's neck. It hisses and shows its vampire fangs. Don't kill me. Don't you love me anymore? Where's Angie? Where's my sister? He, he has her. Where? I don't know. She saws a single gash across his cheek. Olive fur separates. A purple smile. So pretty. So pretty. He screams. And she keeps him screaming. I don't know where she is. He says when she stops cutting. Don't, don't kill me. I still love you. I love you too. One more cut and he falls in half. The purple blood stains deep. Her apron, her palms, her lips. It smells so sweet. She licks it. Mmm. Concord grapes. Her belly leaps and growls for more. She opens the door to the living room and peers in. Every shadow looks dangerous. Like it could move, jump, dig its fangs into her throat. The ceiling pillows down, water stained with brown clouds. Without even looking for them, she sees the twisted faces hidden in the pattern. Her parents' faces, the neighbors' faces, everyone the house has ever eaten, staring down at her. They are the house, and the house is hungry. The faces can't get you, she tells herself. It's daytime, and there aren't any bears. Just a few more steps, get past the couch. Don't be scared, don't be scared, don't be scared. Shadows move on the mantelpiece and the end tables. She freezes. The family pictures are moving. Brass frames buckling into bow-shaped mouths. They want to eat her. Don't be scared, she says. Of course they're hungry. Everything must eat. And there isn't much food these days. One picture is starved to death. She knows because it doesn't move. Only dead things are still. The picture is Angie. Eyes like blue diamonds, all straw hair and smiles, having a tea party with the teddy bears. Before the magic came back. Before everything came alive. The stairs creak and sag under her feet. One even whines like a hungry dog. Shh, she tells it. 
I'll feed you later. The stairs say again. She hears footsteps in the hall, soft whooshes on the rotten rug that sound like tiny voices whispering murder, murder, murder. Her stained hand grips the banister so hard her bones hurt. When she crawls into the attic, she slips on the grape-flavored blood. A dozen teddy bears are scattered with long purple smiles around their necks, spilling jelly onto the greedy floor. She hears someone crying and wonders if it's her sister. Angie? No answer. Just the boards creaking, saying they're hungry. Haven't you had enough blood? But there's never enough blood. She follows the voices and finds Ollie Cat behind the big box of shining Christmas stars. His Oliver Twist clothes are soaked red. A new scent. Strawberries. She didn't know there were other flavors. Her belly reaches out toward the plush cat. You kill the other bears? He starts crying. We were so afraid of you. Uh, what you would uh, what you would do we didn't want to suffer they they asked me to kill them she stares her eyes are empty mouths why did one of them stab you silence then i still love you you all say that the pull-string loop that makes Ollie Cat purr has a thumb stuck in it. Angie's thumb bit off my bare teeth. The little girl takes it, tucks it in her stained apron. What did you do with Angie? He tries to crawl away, but he is too weak. His jelly-filled body folds in on itself and quivers. She pulls the string forces him to purr, drags him back under the knife. He pisses himself then. Sweet strawberry piss. She thinks of Angie, straw hair and smiles. Then she thinks of the thumb. I'm going to make you hurt. A lot. Okay? Uh, okay? He whimpers. She loves strawberries. She sees him out there, hiding behind the street corner on his unicycle, staring at her with eyeless eyes. She moves from window to window, but he is always there. She knows he has her sister, he has Angie, but the little girl is too scared to face him. All she can do is listen to his unicycle creak, creak, creak as he pedals around the house. On the third day, the bear blood runs out. By the next day, she is starving, and the house is starving too. The faces in the ceiling start following her around and smiling at her, always, always smiling. If she doesn't leave soon, they will eat her. She licks the purple stain on her palm, because it is sweet, but every lick she remembers teddy bears screaming and dying. She tries to scrape it off with her fingernails, but no matter how much she licks or scrapes, it will not come out. The little girl holds the knife in front of her and opens the door. He creaks back and forth on his unicycle, beside the rusted swing on the front lawn. He says. The hungry houses behind him lean toward her. Boards creak. Bricks pour powdered mortar like blood. Hungry. I gave you blood. There's never enough blood. He smiles with black lips. Do you know who I am? Angie knew. You're him. <sighs> no. I'm him. Like the song. Like the song on your palm. 
She spreads her four fingers wide and sees her scraping has reduced the stain to shapes. Words, no, not words, thoughts. She cuts them away with the knife because they say the truth, but no matter how deep she cuts, they stay. When the skin is gone, her blood starts singing with words that aren't words until they echo down from the sky, and she is crying now. She has never cried before. Her tears taste like strawberries and grapes. Where is my sister? Where did you hide all the children? He eats her then. Black mouth stretches wider than the sky. She falls, and the falling is like flying, soft wind sweet and cool, freedom. Her hand sings to her, but she can't understand it anymore. The notes shiver her blood. She opens her eyes, and the stomach is huge around her, dark and dank above, the echo of water dripping, subterranean vastness with hungry shadows. She follows hints of light, wondering where the light comes from. Then she realizes that the light comes from her, bloody hand burning bright, where she carved away the words. She presses her red palm forward, four fingers singing against the darkness. Soon, she finds a wall, moist, fleshy, hundreds of eyeballs set deep in the skin, monocle loops glisten like the halos of devils. Each eye stares at her in turn, black tongues where the pupil should be, hungry mouths eating up the light of her. Her hand begins to fade, and she feels dry and brittle and sandy inside, a doll full of sawdust, barely any blood. She runs away from the wall of eyes, away from the hunger and the naked need. Angie sits in the shadows at a table with two steaming teacups. But Angie isn't Angie anymore. Her face is china and glimmers with blue and purple and silver underneath, black opal eyes half-lidded. Her straw hair is silky now, but the wrong texture. He... Stole your eyes. Sit down, says Angie. Have some tea. Her lips and cheeks are bright strawberry, but they don't move when she speaks. She is too perfect, too still. Only dead things are still. The little girl peers into the cups, hollow white and painted with shadow. There isn't any tea, Angie. Just steam. Empty steam. Oh, all you have to do is sit. Be still. Just for a moment. Is... is that what you did? Be still? It's what we all do, eventually. The girl holds up her hand and burns the darkness back with her fading soul. A hundred tables shine back... Countless dolls sitting in broken circles, pale china faces so still. You can't fight him, you know. Sit down. Be still. I'm too hungry to be still. I'm not hungry. If you sit, you won't be either. Silence like ice between them. Angie remains perfect and pale. The little girl sweats and steams. Do you have my thumb? Angie asks at last. I ate it. Ate it? So hungry, you don't know. The whole world is starving since the magic came back. The houses, the teddy bears, the swing sets. Everything has to eat now. Everything has blood. The girl licks her lips, remembers the Concord grapes. Angie's voice sounds scared. You're thinking about eating me too, aren't you? No, the little girl lies. I came to rescue you, to bring you back. To what? There's nothing left. There has to be something left. Oh, you can't beat him. Sit down. Rest. 
Just for one second? I'm taking you home, Angie. I don't want to go. I like it here. You will too. The little girl steals Angie then, tucks her under her right arm, and runs. The girl doesn't know where she's going until she gets there. The wall of eyes. She stops when she sees it, awed by the size and the countless glistening monocle loops. How many eyes does he have? She asks. All of them. The eyes turn toward her again, one by one, as she walks past. The red light from her hand flickers, fades. Sand starts to scrub inside her veins. They eat up the light of you, Angie says. They turn you into sawdust in China. The hungry eyes with black tongues. You're the milk. They're the cats. Just a little further... The little girl tells herself. Her breath comes in short gasps. She is so hungry. Her stomach feels full of cold, gnashing teeth. What are you looking for, anyway? You'll never find it. Then the little girl stops and points. Look! Angie, your eyes! Blue diamonds. Blue diamonds. She sets Angie down and pulls the knife from her apron. The blade a slice of fire in the shadows. She grabs a fistful of flesh and slime. She pulls herself up, stabs with the knife, pulls herself up farther. The nearest eye licks her with its black tongue. She feels so cold. Angie keeps telling her to come down, to rest, to be still. But she doesn't. She climbs like this until she is next to the blue diamonds. She reaches deep into the socket and pulls one free with a pop. It rolls over in her palm and looks at her. The wall grumbles and shakes. Sand spews out and glitters in the air. Don't do it, Angie says. I don't want my old eyes. I like my black opals. The little girl is shivering now. How can eyeballs be so cold? They burn. She reaches in and grabs the other eye. It tries to shake her grip. The monocle loop twists, tries to cut her and steal her blood. The edge sharper than scissors, sharper than her knife. Don't do it, Angie says again. The wall shakes like jelly now. The rumbling gets louder. The girl pulls the eye free. The sand pours like a river where the eyes used to be and rips open the wall. Already there is a pile of golden sand below. The slimy wall slips in her grasp. She grabs for it and again she misses and falls end over end. But the sand catches her. She struggles to her feet and staggers to her sister. As Angie screams, the little girl pries out the black opals and pushes the old eyes in. They're too big at first, but she jams them in, and somehow they work. Then Angie blinks. You beat him, she says. Her lips don't look painted, instead like flesh. But they don't move either. You beat him. Maybe. Just a little. The little girl wonders how her sister's eyes would taste. The sand rages down. The rest of the eyes in the wall spit out on golden jets of dust. Then, just as suddenly, the sand stops. The eyes on the ground stand up, using their black tongues like legs and begin to hop around. The monocle loops are still around them and spin like saw blades. The eyes are hungry, Angie says. We should leave. The sisters stare past the torn wall and into the core of him. They see golden gears, silver levers, teddy bears as big as they are running and running in a turning cage to keep the bellows pumping. A whistle sounds in the fiery vast. Jets of steam wet the air and make it boil. And behind the gears and the grinding and the whistling steam, they hear a clang, clang, clang. Constant, never varying. I think that's his heart, the little girl says. It is. I can feel it in my seams. His hungry, starving metal heart. 
The little girl grabs a gear and starts to climb. The heart is far below them now. She can see it still through the forest of gears, a giant kettle with a metal arm scooping out green soup and pouring it into funnels. Every scoop the arm hits bottom, clang, clang, clang. The soup stinks like rotten meat. She thinks she can see car tires in it, but her stomach still growls. Are you still hungry? Angie says from under the girl's arm. Yes. Are you still thinking about eating me? She doesn't answer. She kicks a gear instead, hoping to hurt him. But the gear doesn't budge. Then she hears a new sound, like a screen door slamming. She sees teddy bears climbing toward her. He sent the bears loose. Run! She kills the first bear near him's skull, cuts its hand off, then stabs it in the heart. The body falls with the knife still wedged in it tight and bounces gear to gear until it hits a catwalk. Splat. A smear of thick green jelly. No fair. He was Apple. Apple's my favorite, Angie says. And I'm hungry too. The little girl stashes the hand in her apron. We'll eat it later, she says. She licks her fingers clean before she climbs and tries not to worry about how she will kill the other bears without a knife. The skull is a hall of mirrors. Dark voids full on her own shape. Shorter here, fatter there, taller. And then a mirror that turns her body into cubes and moves them around. An eye where her lips should be, her teeth in her throat. She stares. The teddy bears are coming. They're coming. Angie sounds calm. Too calm. Do you want to get away? I don't like being hungry. Easier to be still. The little girl shivers. Angie is bigger now, heavier. Her hair looks more like straw. The little girl wonders how she will feed Angie when she can't feed herself. They find a ball of lightning bolts hissing and shivering against each other like snakes, each white bolt trying to eat the next until it seems that each one is eating itself. Throbbing heat presses itself into their faces. Him soul, Angie says. The little girl reaches her hand out toward the snakes of light but doesn't touch. Somehow the lightning is inside her eyes. He is changing me, Angie, making me into something new. Angie is quiet for a moment. Then... The bears, they're here. The bears step around a corner, wielding sharpened gears tied to sticks, homemade meat cleavers to cleave girl meat. Angie cowers in the corner, shaking. Her hair looks like straw. The little girl is tired and worn too thin. She's seen too much violence, done too much. She doesn't want to hurt anyone anymore. Don't make me do this, she says to the bears. Don't make me kill you. A big blue bear with white paws laughs, steps forward. He doesn't have to say he doesn't believe her. He says it by raising the sharp-toothed gear. The little girl grabs a fistful of thunder with her four-fingered hand. The flesh scorches and blackens, smells like burnt bacon. White lightning bleeds inside, turns red. The psalm in her palm pulses loud, a hammer on the ears. The bears freeze mid-step. They see their doom in red lightning. She throws Zeus from the hand of a child. The bears are red ashes then, and the lightning returns and hides inside her hand. Him's skull unfolds outward like paper, white bone origami undone, smoke, the scent of cheesecake. Two blocks ruined, houses smoking voids. The swing set charred so it can only limp along on one rusted leg. Doll bodies scattered everywhere, slowly changing to flesh. But him is still, still and dead. All the many pieces of him, strewn and smoking and unmoving. 
but the little girl can feel her hand tingle, seize the sparks. Because they are starving, she and Angie eat the apple-flavored hand. The girl starts at the pinky, Angie at the thumb. One by one, the stolen children awake, some with their own eyes, some with black opals still, and the two sisters tell them, Don't sit on the swing set, and don't trust your friends, and feed any house before you go in. The world is alive since the magic came back, and children are small and make a good snack, and everything tricks, and everything cheats, and everything, everything, everything eats. So, apparently we learned a couple of things from that story. Children are frightening as hell, and a teddy bear's circulatory system consists of smuckers. Ha! Huh, who'd have thunk it? So, I wonder if that means the stuff that comes out of the interns is strawberry jam. While I find the answer to that mystery, why don't you take in this important message? Terrence! Terrence! Come here. Yes, sir, Mr. Carlisle? I need you to help me figure something out. Sure thing. <laughs> oh, no! No! Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Such an enthusiastic little guy. We'll be right back, folks. This is Jason Hill. If you enjoy my readings on this episode of the Simply Scary Podcast, please check out my expanding library of horror narration and original artwork on the Jason Hill YouTube channel. Thank you. Well, I for one am fairly disappointed. I tried to tell you. You know, before you went all berserker on him. Well, how the hell was I supposed to know? Uh, hey, buddy. The red light's on. <laughs> oh, we're back. Ugh, glad you have returned. And now it is time for our second frightening fantasy. Benny has been a bad boy. And the boss has decided to bring Benny back down to Earth. But unfortunately for Benny, a slow death would be more welcome than what awaits him. If you are frightened by cramped quarters, folks, you might want to set out this roller coaster ride. Jason Hill returns to perform Kevin Anderson's The Box Born Wraith. Not like this, Chow, Benny pleaded. Just shoot me, please! Chow shook his head. You know, I can't, Ben. The boss was very specific. Now get in the goddamn box. Benny gazed down at the six-foot-long wooded crate at the bottom of the shallow grave. It looked to be hurried work. Imperfect corners, protruding nails. Chow's men weren't carpenters. They were killers. And this box, with all its imperfections, buried in the middle of an old graveyard, was Benny's coffin. He knew it was pointless to beg, but Benny didn't know what else to do. Please, Chow, not alive. Don't bury me alive. Jump down there, you skimming bastard, or I'm gonna blow your kneecaps off. Chow aimed his gun at Benny's legs. If you don't panic... You got about 24 hours of air. You really want to spend that time in agony? Benny considered for a second, but before he decided, one of Chow's men pushed him in. He landed on his feet and stood up fast, the top of the grave coming to his chest. Benny's heart pounded, and even in the cool October night, his black hair was matted with sweat. Chow knelt down. You know, the boss owns this old boneyard. 
Bought it a year back when the last vacancy filled. He thought it'd be a nice place to bury the trash, Benny. You'll be the first. Benny looked out at the gravestones jutting up from a thin layer of fog. Orange moonlight shimmered off a hundred forgotten epitaphs. The only earthborn sources of light came from the porches outside the cemetery. Jack-o'-lanterns burned brightly in the surrounding neighborhood. And as Benny was about to start begging again, he caught a glint of movement in the distance. Chow saw it too, and Benny felt the muzzle of the revolver pressed up to his jaw. Go ahead, Ben. Call out. Benny gazed at the trick-or-treaters skipping along the sidewalk outside the cemetery, a small group of parents close in tow. Make one sound and I'll blow your mouth clean off. Then I'll have to go kill some kids. You don't want to go down like that, Ben. And I ain't in no mood to kill kids. Benny opened his mouth. Chow leaned closer. Then maybe when that is done, I go pay a little visit to your house, Benny boy. Say hello to that nice wife and kid of yours. Where is he tonight, Ben? Out trick-or-treating? Benny grabbed Chow's collar. You stay away from my family, you son of a bitch! Chow pointed the gun into Benny's grave. Get in the box, and they'll be fine. Benny knew far too well that Chow didn't make threats. He made promises. The sadistic pig would have no problem abusing his family while Benny slowly suffocated. Sighing, Benny let his hands fall to his side gazed down at the place where he was meant to die. It was cold, hard, and dark. Dad a boy, now lie down and let's get this done. Benny lowered himself down and the darkness swept over him like a blanket. Chow, let me have a light. Chow kicked some dirt into the grave, landing on Benny's chest. Won't change nothing. I don't want to die in the dark. Chow pulled a flashlight from his back pocket and tossed it down. We all die in the dark, Benny. Fumbling with the flashlight, Benny pulled it to his chest as Chow's men threw down the lid. One of them jumped in the hole to hammer in the nails. Benny placed his hands on the lid as it was slid into place. Then he lifted his head and peered through the cracks. Chow stood, holstered his gun, and turned to go. Hey, Chow, Benny called. Yeah, Benny clenched his teeth. If I ever see you again, Chow smiled. You won't. Benny closed his eyes as the first nail was put in place. He managed to make it through the hammering okay, staying calm, retreating into thoughts of his wife and son. But when the dirt started to fall in loud clumps, Benny started to lose control. His body shook, and he started pounding, then clawing at the lid. Wooded shards broke loose and stabbed the tender skin under his nails. Blood ran down his fingers as the sound of falling dirt became distant, replaced by the creaking of wood making up his coffin. He placed his hands flat on the lid, realizing that it was bowing inward from the weight of the dirt. For some reason, he started to laugh, thinking that the lid might implode and crush him. But after a few still moments, Benny realized he wasn't going to be that lucky. The smell of earth, sweat, and freshly cut wood filled his nostrils as he tried to take slow breaths. With no place to go, the sounds of his breathing bounce around the box like a trapped bat, amplifying his panic, feeding his dread. Benny tried to occupy his mind and not think about his itching neck or his aching legs. He desperately wanted to bend his knees, just for a few seconds, and the fact that he couldn't was maddening. He pounded the lid with his fists and screamed, Then he heard the faint sounds of someone sobbing. And as he pressed his forehead at the top of the box, he realized the sobbing was his. His echoing cries continued for twenty minutes. Then, energy spent, he passed out. He awoke with a jolt, trying to sit up and smacked his head on the unforgiving wood, an instant reminder that the nightmare of being buried alive hadn't been a nightmare at all. He moved the light so he could see his watch, just past midnight. He'd been buried for four hours. Twenty hours to go, he thought. I can do this. I can do this. Just make it through the next twenty hours without losing my mind. And 
And, 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 and. A distant sound seized his attention. Benny held his breath, straining to hear it again. He pressed his ear to the lid, and there it was again. A faint digging sound. Someone was digging. I meant... <coughs> he tried to call out, but his previous screams had strained his voice. It had to be Chow digging him up, Benny thought. Maybe the boss just wanted to teach him a lesson. Hmm, seemed a bit extreme, but the digging got closer. Or maybe it was teenagers out on a dare, digging up a fresh grave. <laughs> yeah, that might be it. It's the kind of Halloween stunt he'd have pulled as a kid. Right? Benny pounded the lid again. Here! I, uh, I'm in here! But even before the echo of his voice had faded, he noticed something very, very wrong with the sound of the dirt being moved. It was getting closer. More hurried. And it seemed only a few feet away. But the closer it got, the more wrong it seemed. It wasn't until Benny turned his head and pressed an ear at the bottom of the box that he realized what it was. The digging wasn't coming from above. It was coming from below. Oh, Jesus! Benny cried, gripping the flashlight, shining its beam around the box. He could feel dirt fall away beneath him, the bottom of the box sagging downward, hanging over a black hole in the earth. Something scraped on the bottom and Benny jumped. He squirmed, trying to roll to his side. But before he could, something clawed its way down the length of the coffin. Benny froze, taking a deep breath. He turned his head to the side, aiming the light into the widest seam in the box. The beam bounced off a dirt wall a few feet away, and he saw deep claw marks in its surface. He could hear movement outside, accompanying his panicked breathing. But every time he chased it down with his flashlight, there was nothing. Then, like earthworms caressing his skin, he felt warm air on the back of his neck. Something very close exhaled. Pulse pounding, he whirled around, eyes wide. He was terrified to see something from outside glaring in. Large, white eyes with thick eyelids of pale skin blinked, and then narrowed curiously. Benny kicked the box. Get away! He reared for another kick, but a dozen clawed hands burst through the box, seized every limb, then pulled him, screaming downwards. His head slammed hard into the dirt as bits of wood rained down around him. He blinked a few minutes and got his focus, instantly wishing he hadn't. A dozen golf ball-sized eyes set inside hideous faces surrounded him. Before Benny took a breath, he felt clawed hands grab his shirt. The creature pulled Benny's face in close, sniffing him through a pair of slits below its wide eyes. It then howled angrily and pushed Benny away. Some of the other creatures moved away in revulsion. Some looked angry, and one just stared, astonished. Sitting up, Benny took a good look at his captors. Their long arms allowed them simian-like movements, reaching forward on worn knuckles and swinging their legs underneath. If it wasn't for their long, noseless faces and the bald skin that hung off them like sharp haze, Benny would have thought them hairless chimps. A few of the creatures wore clothes, not for function, more for decoration. Then he cringed in horror, recognizing several popular tattoo patterns on their garments, realizing their clothes were fashioned entirely of human skin. Benny felt a push on the back toward a torchlit corridor, and as the small group started to move, he had to stay crouched in the four-foot-high passage, which was perfect for the size of its inhabitants. Stumbling around the descending tunnel, Benny was prodded from behind with a blow every few minutes. He could hear them talking in a language he'd never heard before, but the tone was unquestionably angry. Suddenly, he emerged into an enormous gymnasium-sized chamber. Coffins stacked up like bleachers lined the walls. The seats were filled with females of the species and hordes of their brood. As he walked past, the smaller eyes of the young ones glazed over with hunger, staring at him, disappointment flashing over all their gaunt faces. The scene reminded Benny of pictures of starving children, bloated stomachs, 
ripe with malnutrition. A tall, thin female wearing human teeth around her neck like a pearl necklace emerged from behind a pile of discarded jewelry, watches, and gold fillings. She walked towards Benny, holding a staff constructed of bone. The others cleared a path, and Benny tried to stand up straight. She tapped his chest with the staff, then placed a hand over his heart. Benny felt it beat faster at her touch. She shook her head, then turned to her people and spoke in their strange language. They didn't like what she had to say. Commotion exploded around the room. Some yelled with rage, some sobbed. The one that had grabbed him earlier pushed to the front and started yelling. He held a broken femur like a dagger and thrust it up and down. The female jabbed her staff into the dirt defiantly. The larger male took a step back with a slight bow, but then roared savagely and lunged at Benny. Benny brought his hands up as the creature landed on his chest, swinging a fist. Benny connected with the side of its bald head. It fell back, howling like some enraged ape, then came again, this time with teeth bared. Benny heard a crunch and screamed as it bit into his wrist. Feeling the teeth touching bone, he knew he had only seconds before he lost his hand. He pulled with all his strength, wildly thrashing and kicking at his attacker. But the creature suddenly let go. It stumbled back, gagging. Benny's blood splattered on its face. It gasped for air, grabbed its throat, then fell to the dirt floor. Its tiny legs twitched, and then it lay still. Dead. Before Benny could check his wound, the female pulled him up, dragged him to the rear of the chamber and through an opening. Crouching, Benny whirled around and saw her wave the bone staff at the doorway. In an instant, the opening to the room vanished, replaced by a wall of dirt. Thinking it safe for a moment, Benny examined his wrist. To his astonishment, he wasn't even bleeding. The cuts were deep, but there was no pain. It's like he was looking at a wound on someone else's body. The female moved past him and Benny gazed around the room, noticing the familiarity of his new surroundings in an instant. It had a high cathedral ceiling, pews made entirely of coffins, and a podium of mud and bone. Beyond that was an altar, decorated with elaborate hieroglyphs. The creatures were depicted here carrying coffins, worshipping them, and feasting on their contents. Life, the female said. The boxes are life. Benny's head was spinning. He started to understand. A word floated around in his mind, for a few moments seemingly searching for some sane place to land. When sanity seemed unavailable, he finally just said it. Ghouls! boxes empty so long she said her speech labored as if struggling for every syllable then you you eat the dead to live then he said more to himself than to his savior remembering what happened to the one that had just bit him he knew why they couldn't consume him alive living blood was poisonous but why don't you just kill me and eat me after, he said. I mean, you're ghouls, right? She thrust the staff past the altar toward a mud statue of a female, arms spread wide, reaching for the surface. No, her mother forbids it. Must not make dead, no kill, forbidden. Mother forbids, Benny repeated. Well, don't that beat all. The ghouls got religion. He looked into her huge eyes as an idea erupted in his mind. You know, I think you and I can work this out. Benny pointed up. You send me up there, and I'll fill your boxes for you. Man, oh man, will I fill your boxes. Benny 
saw the female smile. A yellowed, jagged-toothed grin. And he knew she understood. Not much later, Benny clawed his way out of the ground through a narrow hole in the earth the female ghoul had created with a thrust from her bone staff. Flopping around in the cemetery grass, he took a deep breath of air, the cold night invigorating every muscle in his body. He rolled over and looked at his wound. It still didn't hurt. He'd almost forgotten about it. The tears in the flesh seemed only scratches now. And beneath, he could feel his muscles pulse with energy he'd never felt before. There was a tingle on his scalp, and he ran his fingers through his hair. Thick, black strands fell away. He looked at the clumps in his hands, sighing. Small price to pay, he said with a grin. Then he took a deep breath, then jumped to his feet with simian grace. He felt strong very hungry and ready to make good on a promise. He didn't know what he was becoming, but he did know that Chow would be the first to find out. It seems like this story is just getting started. What's in store for those that left Benny to die? Well, it looks like you'll have to fill in that ending for yourselves. At least for the time being. When we return, we'll finish the ending to the story of this episode. And you'll want to join us for these announcements. Because if you don't, I may have to pay you a little visit. And we don't want that. Do we? If you are enjoying this episode's stories, be sure to visit simplyscarypodcast.com and from the homepage, click on About, then Authors to learn more about the unique worlds created by S. Boyd Taylor and Kevin Anderson, the authors of tonight's chilling experiences. Be sure to click on Kevin David Anderson to find more tales like The Box-Born Wraith, including links to his works on Amazon and how to find him on social media and links to his website. And now, back to the Simply Scary Podcast. Alright folks, listen up. You'll want to hear this. First... For those authors out there listening, here's your chance to reach a new audience without emptying your pockets. Reach out to us at contact at simplyscarypodcast.com and schedule a free consultation on how our staff can adapt your work into an audiobook suitable for sites such as audible.com. If you have a story that you think is scary enough for Simply Scary, visit simplyscarypodcast.com. And click submit a story at the top of the page. And if it passes our independent torture tests, your work could be heard on our broadcast. Next up, on February 15th, 2017, we will be launching a Kickstarter campaign to fund our most ambitious project yet. Creating an animated series featuring nightmarish landscapes from the mind of artist David Romero. Experience his playlist on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel to get a taste of what fans are raving about. With you fans at the helm, we can make this a reality. Funding adaption of such favorites as The Scarecrow Corpse, performed by Markiplier himself, and new productions we have yet to reveal. Hit that subscribe button below to stay tuned in to this upcoming project and learn more in the coming month about the special rewards that will come with your support. Another way you can show support for our type of terror is by becoming a patron today. Your support will help fund our future productions and give you access to the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights library of audio experiences in the highest quality possible digital downloads plus other never-before-released extras you won't find anywhere else. Go to simplyscarypodcast.com and click the Patrons button at the top of the page. 
Our channel and entertainment experiences are fully fan-funded. So stop putting the future of your entertainment in the hands of some tie-wearing but tasty corporate cable lackey. Turn off the lights and turn on the dark yourself by becoming a patron after the show. Finally, since we're discussing membership access, it's time to reveal our lucky iTunes review. This week's super fan is... Sweet Revenge. And Sweet Revenge writes, I listen to this podcast at work. I love all the stories and a few of them have seriously freaked me out. Seems like everyone likes to interrupt me, which makes me jump, but that's part of the fun. Otis Jiry is my hero. Thank you, Sweet Revenge, for leaving us your review. You're going to love what we have in store for you. Join us here on YouTube this Saturday, December 17th, for the premiere of Walking in the Dark, starring the man himself, the Morgan Freeman of the internet, Otis Jiry, as he leads us down the darkened path in his very own series. Every week, he will be your guide into the underworld, and spend yarns of supernatural proportions as only he can. We have much more macabre waiting in the wings for you, so become a patron, subscribe, and share us with everyone you know to expand our brand of entertainment. Sweet Revenge, we'll need you to send a screenshot of your iTunes profile page along with your profile name and your comment too. Contact at simplyscarypodcast.com if you want to hear your review read on the show, subscribe to Simply Scary on iTunes and leave us a review, preferably with five stars. This is Archibald Carlyle. <clears throat> oh, and the other half. Yeah, thank you. Thanking you for joining us for this broadcast. GM Danielson will return next episode to escort you through our terrifying tales. So remember, listeners, don't leave your toys alone for too long, or else they may get lonely and come looking for you. We'll see you next time, when we show you there is nothing simple about being scared. Unless, of course, it is the Simply Scary Podcast. This is executive producer Jesse Cornett. If you like what you hear, be sure to check out more from these authors at simplyscarypodcast.com. There you can find all information regarding the show and the stories appearing here in our podcast. The Simply Scary Podcast is a production of Chilling Entertainment. The showcase is written by Jesse Cornett and Dustin Kosky and produced by Jesse Cornett. The host of the Simply Scary Podcast is GM Danielson. Original music during the show by Jesse Cornett. This broadcast was directed and created by Craig Groshek. Be sure to look for the Simply Scary Podcast on iTunes. And if you like the show, leave us a five-star review. Comments or questions? Email us at contact at simplyscarypodcast.com and check our website for more information. While you're there, consider clicking on the patrons link at the top of the page to help support our show. Copyright Chilling Entertainment, LLC, 2016. Thanks for listening. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. <laughs>